Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Mental Health Professionals Network webinar, Understanding First Episode Psychosis. There are currently about 520 of you online, which is fantastic. So thanks and welcome to everybody who's joined us and also to those people who are going to watch it on the podcast later. We'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and um, for to, uh, across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located and we pay respect to the Elders past, present and future for the memories, the traditions, the culture and the hopes of Indigenous Australia. I need to apologise, I normally have some printed instructions but my printer decided to break and after a few um, episodes of behaving like Dennis Denudo off the castle, I gave up and loaded it on my laptop. So I'll be looking across to the side a bit more than usual. Um, I'm Mary Emilias, I'm a GP and a psychotherapist from Cairns in far north Queensland. Um, I've facilitated a few webinars for MHPN which I really enjoy. I have a particular interest in young people working at Headspace and um, particularly early psychosis. So it uh, was a real privilege to be invited to join in tonight. And um, I'd like to introduce our panellists. So you will have um, seen their biographies before we started. So first of all, I'd just like to welcome you, Morlan. Now, I think you're based in uh, Melbourne. What's it like down there today? It's uh, been very, very wet this morning, but this afternoon not too bad. So we don't have to water our garden. Well, welcome, Morlan. We actually had a thunderstorm brewing here, and I was hoping we didn't lose power, but the thunderstorm went away. So. Um, now I'd like next to welcome Toby, who's um, a mental health nurse and academic from Sydney. Toby, um, I just wonder if you could tell us a little, you have quite a bit of involvement with early psychosis, don't you? How did you get involved in that in the first place? Oh, it's a long story, Mary, but re really just generally uh, working with people with uh, mental illness and comorbid problems. Um, you know, started off Triple Care Farm, which was around the Southern Highlands up here in New South Wales, um, and then started working with people in the inner city of homeless, uh, homeless people in the inner city of Sydney through the o Oasis uh, Youth Support Network, uh, and then led a nurse-led charity for about a decade before moving across into academia. So, pleased to be here. Well, it's great to have you. Thanks, Toby. Now, Shona, I. I've actually forgotten. I think you're based in Victoria. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. That's right. I'm in Melbourne as well. And you're at Origin. That's right. I work at yes. um, at at Origin. Um, started with the early psych psychosis program Epic when it first started way back in 1992. So I've uh, seen Epic evolve and um, become the Origin Centre over over those years. Well, it's great to have you with us tonight. And then um, Grant, you're in Northern Beaches of Sydney, I believe, with That's a right. specialist, a specialist uh, youth mental health team. Is that right? Yes, I work with a team called Beak, which is Beaches Early Intervention Centre in, in Sydney, and I uh, also do a bit with uh, public health and population health data around early psychosis and substance comorbidity as well. Well, it's great to have you, and I'm looking forward to the discussion with everyone tonight. And so we'll just go on to the ground rules for tonight's webinar. So just um, remembering that this is a, as though it were a face-to-face -face activity. So if you're um, typing things into the chat box, remember that everybody can see them and be respectful of other panellists and, and the participants. Um, please post your comments and questions for the panellists in the gen general chat box. I've also received the questions that you submitted before um, when you registered for the webinar. We had about 600 questions, and so we're not going to be able to cover yours, everybody's this evening, but hopefully a lot of them will be answered through the panel discussion. If you have any technical issues, um, post into the technical help chat box at the bottom. Um, and just again, remembering everybody can see um, what's there, so try and keep your comments on topic. Uh, if you find the chat distracting, you can click on the small down arrow at the top of the chat box, and then you don't need to see it. Um, and please remember at the end your feedback is really important. So if you can complete the exit survey, um, that's going to appear as a pop-up 
when you exit the webinar. Now, um, you've all read the um, story about our patient, Tim, and we're just going to be um, going on to the learning outcomes slide, uh, with the slides there, Sarah. Thank you. So we're just going to be looking at Tim's story and hopefully we get a better understanding of the warning signs, the indicators of and the prognosis for first episode psychosis. Hopefully feel more confident to support young people who have experienced first episode psychosis and also to increase our confidence in working collaboratively um, in this field. Now, I hope you enjoyed reading the story of Tim because he certainly seemed very familiar to me. And I, I think that there would be elements of work with Tim that would be quite enjoyable. And then I can see that it might be starting to become a bit stressful. So what I'd like to do first, uh, just to remind you that um, each of our, our panellists will give a sort of discipline specific response to this case, so how they might respond if they met Tim. And then we'll be having a discussion together between the panellists and also bringing in the questions that um, you have from the audience. So I would like to welcome um, Dr. Morton Rowland, who's um, a general practitioner, and he's going to talk to us about he, how he might think about somebody like him. Welcome, Morland. Morton, I think we might have your audio on mute. Just sorry, put you on mute. Um, sorry about that. Um, hi, I'm Morton Rowland. I'm a GP in Melbourne, but I've also worked rurally um, and have had a long-standing help uh, and uh, been working with psychosis and anxiety depression for quite some time. Um, I'm going to speak basically as a GP uh, and from that point of view, it's a very broad brush that we need to take as GPs to start with. Um, but mainly our roles in this situation is to try and gather the information together and work out what, what are the problems. Um, often these cases are actually brought to our attention by family members, um, not necessarily by the young person themselves, although it could be, um, depending on the GP's uh, uh, needs and wants. They can be associated with some schools and things like that, which might bring that information to their attention or the university, uh, depending on how old. Um, the main issues for a GP to start with is who's being impacted by this? Who, what are they um, uh, doing that is making it socially difficult for that person? Um, and indeed, the question has to be asked, what is normal? Um, is this outside of the normal? Uh, is it just uh, flamboyance? Um, it's, it's sometimes difficult to get that right, particularly in the early stages for this. Um, the other thing that the GP needs to do is start by setting some goals and expectations, both for the patient and also for the people who are concerned. Um, GPs are going to be treating the, the patient, but also the family. and. Um, Sometimes there is issues between who's actually got the problem. Is it the young person? Is it, um, is it actually the family that's more concerned? Uh, and therefore we need to work out with that person how do we move forward? What are the services that might be needed? And how we maintain uh, particularly their confidentiality? Uh, between different types of consultation, um, what that person is comfortable for others to know um, and what they may or may not be comfortable to know. Um, the other issue is around some of the medical legal uh, issues. Are they always in concern um, and do they need to uh, be um, 
scheduled or what are, are they going to hurt themselves? Those sort of things we have statutory requirements for. Um, at a more local level, what are the services that are available to me in order to send Tim to the best deaf person? Um, this is a difficult issue because the distribution of services can be sort of all over the place. Um, and uh, particularly in rural areas, um, it can sometimes be very difficult for GPs to uh, refer on, although you may in fact be able to use things like telehealth, which may help. Um, and predominantly we would be liking to treat these sort of cases as a team um, because they can, as was intimated in the introduction, they can be very challenging and um, you don't necessarily want the person to completely uh, attach to you. Um, lastly, we need to work out what is the supports that are going to be needed into the future, uh, how we can counsel Tim and his family, how can we keep him in therapy, um, and when to escalate the care and to where. So with that, I might uh, uh, hand it back. Thanks very much, Morlin. Um, that was well within your allotted time frame. Um, and it's, look, it's really helpful to just think about the kinds of things that a GP needs to keep in mind. Um, there are 735 people online now, which is great. And I noticed that we've got people from all over Australia, including someone from Lightning Ridge, which I think is fantastic. So if people as diverse as Lightning Ridge, Perth, Rockhampton, Northern New South Wales, Tasmania um, are upskilling in early psychosis, that to me seems like great news. So Toby, I'd like to um, welcome you now to talk about how you might respond to Tim and his family um, from a mental health nurse perspective. Thanks, Toby. Sure. Thanks, Mary. Well, uh, hello, everyone. My name's Toby Rayburn. I teach now at the University of Sydney, but I'm a nurse practitioner in mental health. And for many years before that, a credentialed mental health nurse, and I've done things in a variety of settings. Um, so tonight, you know, I thought I'd start with this initial screen, which really highlights that um, mental health nurses may meet people like Tim, um, or Tim specifically, uh, in a wide range of contexts. And context is crucial when it comes to this types of approaches that mental health nurses might use. So there are mental health nurses who work in GP surgeries uh, with the mental health nurse incentive program. Uh, nurses may visit Tim's home, which is, is very valuable and might talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Uh, headspace centres, mental health nurses work in private practice now uh, and there's obviously public hospital based sort of community mental health teams. Uh, based at centres, also also based in mobile uh, teams. And then there's uh, large groups of mental health nurses who work in emergency wards and hospital inpatient units. And if you look at Tim's case study, we can probably uh, see that, um, you know, it's going to be a, a bit of a journey. And I'm sure most of us uh, in, the, in the web meeting tonight would have come across people like Tim and this next screen just highlights the idea that, um, as we know, recovery is not a, a linear pro process. So it's not something that we expect that Tim will sort of go through, um, you know, a diagnosis, uh, treatment, and then get uh, clear, clear outcomes. Recovery in a mental health sense tends to be uh, more of a personal journey. And these are just some of the principles that have been written about by uh, people with a lived experience of mental illness over many years and so there's a huge amount of research now that's been um, conducted on the lived experience of people with mental illness and what they say actually assists them towards mental health recovery. And so these can give us a bit of a guiding light in Tim's case around the sorts of things that mental health nurses in whatever context that we work in might like to be, uh, you know, moving towards the so connectedness, hope and optimism identity, meaning and purpose and empowerment. And so 
they're the goalposts, if you will, and they're taken from Mike Slade and his team's work from um, King's College in, in London. They've done a, a lot of good research over the last decade on, on recovery-orientated approaches to mental health care. So now moving through to these last uh, screens of mine, I'm just going to focus now and, and again um, emphasising the idea that mental health nurses may work in a wide variety of contexts. Um, I've tried to make these sorts of points as broad as possible so they can be adapted across uh, a range of different context, contexts. Um, but this is first point highlighting that, you know, from a recovery orientated point of view, we really want to be focusing on the idea of mental health assessment, uh, focusing more on strengths, uh, abilities and activities as opposed to indicators or symptoms and illness. And I really like something that um, Pat McGorry said a couple of years ago where he was talking about the idea of whether a mental illness exists and he talked about the, the importance of perhaps talking, instead of talking about mental illness, talking about mental ill health. I think that can um, provide a nice platform for us as we try to think about how can we assist him um, in a collaborative kind of way to work towards some of these some of these sorts of principles which people with a lived experience of mental health, uh, men mental ill health, tell us are, are useful. And so being interested in Tim's strengths, um, and then also, you know, I think one of the things that the highlights the case study highlights really nicely is um, is the importance of uh, holistic assessment. So you know, taking um, you know a, a fuller look at Tim's drug and alcohol history will be an important part of the assessment. I think as Morton's already highlighted, there'll be a wide ranging sort of in depth uh, level of assessment that will need to take place at, at, in, in, in any context that we work with with Tim. So then uh, the second thing that mental health nurses uh, do really well and, and um, is psychotherapy and I've just used the motivational interviewing little um, mnemonic here, uh, ORS, uh, open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections and, and summarising and those things are all pretty self-explanatory but they just give us a nice guide for starting out in engaging him in the initial uh, kind of relationship um, in the medium to long term, we'll be wanting to adapt uh, our psychotherapeutic approach. So whether or not we use a cognitive behaviour therapy type approach, interpersonal psychotherapy may be quite useful in Tim's case, given his, um, you know, the strong emphasis in the case study around some of his relationships. There may, there may be narrative narrative therapy. There may be a number of other psychotherapeutic like psychotherapeutic techniques that might be useful for nurses. Uh, working as part of a collaborative team with Tim. Um, well, we, we want to be setting a foundation so that our relationship is one that Tim feels safe in uh, and that he feels he can come back to it in future as needed. Uh, third thing here is, is social advocacy. So, uh, you know, an emphasis here on the importance of connecting Tim in with uh, vocational pursuits, you know, his theatre community, education, obviously housing and, and relationships. So a huge part of what nurses, mental health nurses need to do in any context is, is advocacy and that may be writing a letter advocating for Tim for a, you know, a particular job. It may be supporting him to, you know, get some assistance with his TAFE studies. Uh, it may be talking with his um, parents about um, ideas about where he's living and, and what may, might be most helpful, depending on, on the context and, and, and where things are going in, in, in his case at the time. Um, another part of advocacy that's really important is, is defending Tim's right to choose. And um, here, we, 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 I think we would all agree that, you know, working collaboratively is, is one thing, but um, we also need to be... Um, you know, providing uh, Tim with, with information which at times may clash with information or, that's given or information that's not given by other professionals and other services. Um, and so we need to be very clear about we know, what we know and what we don't know um, as, as much as possible and, um, and be forthright around, um, around Tim's right to choose. And so then the fourth point I had here was physical health promotion, so seeking to address Tim's 
drug and alcohol use, obviously. Um, your sleep-wake cycle is something uh, that towards the end of the case study is mentioned and isolated behaviour and diet. And pretty much we know that if we can, we can move him towards a more you know, physically healthy, uh, satisfying life in, in areas um, to do with his body, then the, the brain, the, you know, the mental health and physical health are basically, basically one thing. And so physical health promotion there is really important. That may include going for a walk with Tim as part of what we do in a psychotherapeutic kind of a, approach. It may include... Um, you know, encouraging Tim to get down to the gym or, or trying to um, network some other partnerships that we might have in, in those sorts of physical health uh, areas. And the last point I've got there is medication uh, management. Now, I'm a nurse practitioner. I've prescribed medication um, over the years, certainly administered and managed a lot of medication over the years. And so, look, I'm, I'm not, you know, anti-medication, but I do think that... Um, the older I've gotten, the more concerned I've gotten about the long-term effects of some of the stuff that we've been dosing out as nurses over the last couple of decades. And, um, and so I think taking a, a slow approach and staying low with medication is very important. Um, try to avoid antipsychotics. Um, you know, it would be ideal if we could move him towards a more satisfying life and, and try to assist him um, to, to stop his uh, cannabis uh, use. And, you know... In an ideal world, things may resolve quite well for Tim, and I've certainly, I'm sure, other people in the in the meeting would have seen people, um, you know, have so move move towards a satisfying life after they can after they can move past something like that. But in other occasions, um, there, there are more complex things in, in play, and um, so that's where I'd leave it as an introduction tonight. I think. Thanks, Toby. I can see that the um, the the, pan, the chat from the audience is certainly appreciating that very holistic approach and particularly the strength focus. Um, and now I would like to welcome Shona, who's going to talk to us about um, responses a clinical psychologist with um, this area of interest might have for Tim. Thanks, Shona. Thanks, Mary, and thanks, Toby. Um, so when I thought about approaching Tim with a, my clinical psychology hat on, I guess I've come up with um, five slides, each of which talks to a, a principle or a process that I think is important in um, working with young people with early psychosis. And I guess the, the first and foremost is engagement. So I think it's absolutely essential to engage Tim, um, to get him into treatment and to do this as quickly as possible because what we're wanting to do is limit the damage that comes from having an untreated psychosis. There's a term that's used, DUP, duration of untreated psychosis. And we know that um, prior to early intervention in psychosis, lots of people developed psychosis and went untreated for periods of one, two, sometimes five, ten years. And that uh, during this time, there's lots, of, lots, of, lots and lots of damage to their, um, their social networks who they, who they know and what they do and that if we can get in early and prevent this damage that's um, going to help us to um, help Tim get better quickly and to achieve a better functional recovery. So we're wanting to, um, to gain Tim's trust to um, help him to feel safe. Um, if possible, we, we need to um, engage him so that he will tell us everything that's going on. We want to try and avoid hospital if we can. But in order to avoid hospital, we need to have a really good idea about what's going on with him. So we need to have um, the ability to do a good risk assessment, um, the ability to put in place a good crisis plan. So should the risk escalate, that uh, we know how we're going to respond to that. And um, we're usually going to need to involve the family in that as well. So we're going to want to know that there's some other people in the community keeping an eye on, on Tim between appointments. Um, if it proves that he's got a, um, a definite psychosis, which it does look like he has. So um, I guess just good clinical um, engagement skills uh, are needed to, to get Tim to feel safe and trusted. So we want to be um, warm, to, dis to display warmth. We want to be interested in his story. We want to show that we understand what he's going, to, going through. Um, we want to provide information and we need to be flexible. It's really important for us to get a good understanding of what Tim thinks is happening. 
what he might be scared of um, and to provide reassurance and um, to provide optimism and hope. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So the next thing is, um, is collaboration. So uh, we really want Tim to engage. It's really just building more on engagement, I guess. Um, we want to build a strong therapeutic relationship with Tim, a really good rapport, so that um, he can collaborate strongly with, with his psychologist, with his treating team, um, to be involved in this assessment and then to go on to develop a formulation and to be engaged and collaborating in the treatment process. We find that um, collaboration is enhanced um, when we convey to Tim that we believe that he is the expert. He's the one who knows himself, he knows his strengths, he knows about his symptoms and he knows where he wants his life to go. So we want to be having a, a respectful, um, empowering, uh, empowering approach to Tim so that he will collaborate with us in his treatment. So we want him to be active in all aspects of his treatment. Um, and as, as Toby spoke about, we want him to be involved in making decisions about his treatment. So there's a, an area um, of medicine that's gaining more permanent, prominent um, shared decision making. So actually giving the, um, the client or the patient um, as much information as possible in, in order for them to be able to make decisions about, uh, about treatment. So once again, it's about collaboration uh, and engagement. The next um, title is psychoeducation. Um, so psychoeducation really is a, a very important process um, in early psychosis. Once again, it builds on engagement, but it's also about um, providing information, so tailored information about what is psychosis um, and what is the mental health system, because people with early psychosis are often coming up against the mental health system for the first time. We're wanting to once again, engage people to be collaborative um, and then to tailor the information to each individual's experience. So it's not just a matter of giving people brochures but to actually work with the person about what they understand to, um, to be happening to them, um, what's their knowledge about psychosis. And often um, people with early psychosis have experience of psychosis in their family or um, in, in other places and they might have some real fears that, uh, that need to be addressed. Um, within psychoeducation, the stress vul vulnerability model um, is a really good framework to explain psychosis. It's a really good place to start with teaching people about psychosis because it, it tells us that we all have a level of vulnerability so that under certain circumstances everyone will develop psychosis or develop psychotic symptoms and that's the interaction between personal level of vulnerability and the stress that you're experiencing that leads to the development of psychosis. So by conveying this model, we're telling people that they can um, have an influence themselves, so they can um, have hope about recovery and they can behave uh, in ways that will help them stay well. I've just noted buckets and bridges. So there are lots of um, uh, diagrams and stories and um, tools to use to talk to talk to young people or um, any people about the stress vulnerability model and they involve that. Um, and we know from research that psychoeducation, psychoeducation has been shown to improve outcomes in psychosis. So it's a really important process um, in working with people with psychosis. So the next heading is formulation. So a case formulation is, um, I guess, the embodiment of the shared understanding between the psychologist and the client about um, how we understand their situation and, and what's happening and why. So we, based on our engagement and our, our collaboration, we get a really comprehensive assessment. So we understand, we want to understand Tim's developmental history, any past mental health issues, his history of substance use, his current substance use, his current symptoms, when they started, how they evolved, um, and it looks to me like Tim's symptoms are still evolving. Um, we want to know about his recent and his current functioning, some of which we know. We know that he did well at school, that started to drop off towards the end of, of school, didn't do as well as he expected to do, and then um, hasn't transitioned to university or to tertiary particularly well. 
We want to know how he sees himself and what he sees for his future. Where's he headed? headed? And then we synthesise all of this into a story that's really a hypothesis about um, how and why the psychosis developed and then use all of this knowledge to devise a treatment plan that um, Tim agrees on. That's what we ultimately want. We want him to actively collab collaborate in all of these processes um, and the formulation would be, should be constantly reviewed um, as, as recovery occurs or um, as other things happen. So it's, it's really a formulation is a hypothesis that brings all the threads together and that uh, forms the basis of the, of the treatment plan that uh, we're wanting to work on together. And then the final heading I've got is recovery. So it's really important with um, a number of us I think have talked about optimism and hope. Um, I think that's absolutely essential uh, in all work, but in working in early psychosis in particular. So I always work from a stand that recovery is assumed, that, that people I work with are going to get better and it's the focus right from the start. All right, there are some problems here, we've got some issues to deal with, but we are going to uh, improve your situation and get you back on track. So um, we're wanting to embody this optimism and hope and to convey it to Tim um, all of the time and to that's, I guess, helped by focusing on his strengths. So we also, in part of our assessment, we want to know what, what Tim's good at, what he thinks he's good at and what strengths he can bring to bear. Um, functional recovery, so actually getting back out into the world and doing things, um, education, work, hobbies, um, is extremely important to all people, particularly young people. And our research tells us that it's more important to people to achieve functional recovery than to have remission of symptoms. Um, so it's really important for people to get back onto their developmental tra trajectory when we're talking about young people. So based on the formulation and the treatment plan that we've developed, recovery work with Tim would focus on substance use, issues around grief in the loss of his relationship, but also possibly the loss of his potential career or the, his academic success that he, um, I think, was dear to him. We might be looking at depression, because there are certainly some signs there, and we want to look at um, vocational planning. So where, where's he heading? What's, uh, what are we going to be aiming for? And then if psychotic symptoms persist, then we may well be looking at targeting, doing some psychological intervention for psychotic symptoms. But um, early in psychosis, psychotic symptoms usually, or quite often, um, resolve. The other thing is that we want to do some work to bolster his self-esteem, um, help him to adapt to having experienced a, an episode of psychosis, and also um, through good knowledge of himself, um, we want him to have a stress management plan because that's actually going to be his relapse management plan. So what does he need to do to get well and stay well? And uh, yeah, that's my slide. Thanks, Mary. Thanks a lot, Jonah. And we will be coming back to discussing with the panel later. And it's I, I certainly find it really encouraging to hear about hope from the beginning, because I think there often used to be a lot of nihilism about well, when, when a young person had first episode psychosis, even when I went to uni which wasn't all that long ago, only 20 years. Um, now I'd like to welcome our psychiatrist, Grant, from Sydney, um, just to talk about how you um, would respond to Tim. And I imagine you see Tim's every day, Grant. Yeah, look, I think this, this um, scenario is a very um, realistic one uh, and, and very similar to a lot of young, young people that, that we do see. Um, and look, broadly, I, I agree entirely with all of the um, comments that have been made uh, you know, by, the, by the other presenters about the broad approach. And really, I think we're very, um, you know, I'd acknowledge all the work that you know, particularly the team um, in, in Melbourne have done in changing some of the views uh, of, of this over the, over the last few years. So look, um, my perspective would be you know, that Tim at this point definitely needs assessment as soon as possible. There's, Clearly, he's on the cusp of something here, and the aim should be to try and help him resolve this as quickly as possible. It's it's at that point where it could be something that's developing into a psychosis, but it may may not be. But I think it, he definitely needs assessment by a clinician experienced in working with with psychosis. So you know, 
um, a psychologist, a, a nurse practitioner, or a psychiatrist, if you had a multidisciplinary um, psychiatry service in your area, you know that would be uh, it would know, be very suitable to refer Tim to that or a headspace. Um, and I think you know there's there's all the reasons that to be concerned that people have outlined that you know there's the distress and disruption going on in in Tim's life. There's some potential areas of risk, although that's not you know the, the primary thing that jumps out here. And the points that that um, that Shona was just making that we know that earlier treatment is more effective and that longer duration of untreated psychosis is associated with worse outcomes. So it means there's this really important window of opportunity and a real dilemma because on the one hand we've got the need to um, encourage choice and um, uh, and work with someone and, and take a sort of long, slow uh, engagement approach. But also, we know that the clock's ticking as well, and so there's a real need to try and help that person make a, a sensible choice as quickly as possible. Um, uh, it's also worth saying, in terms of what informs the assessment, I think part of that changing view of psychosis highlights some of the things we should assess and, um, and also some of the complexities of assessment. So certainly when I trained, um, you know, the view of psychosis was very much you had these kind of successive stages uh, that, that always followed each other. There was a prodrome and then there was psychosis and really your task in assessment was just to separate schizophrenia from bipolar disorder. I think that view has changed completely um, and now we see a much broader spectrum. Um, we see that psychosis is being on a, on a spectrum and that there's quite a lot of people with a broad vulnerability to psychosis in the community that might manifest in, in all sorts of ways, including brief and, and, and uh, um, uh, fleeting psychotic symptoms. And then about 2 or 3% of the community might get a psychotic syndrome. And I guess it's worth saying, what do we mean by psychosis as a syndrome? I guess it means more than just a fleeting symptom, more than an abnormality of perception or, or thought, but where you've got a number of these things all coming together, abnormal perceptions, abnormal flow of thought, um, abnormal beliefs, abnormal organisation of, of behaviour, agitation, motor changes, and that you've got a number of these things and they're severe enough to cause you distress or dysfunction and they're lasting you know, several days or or a week um, or longer, and so so you know, people crossing over into that threshold might happen to about two to three percent of of people in their lifetime, and then of that, only a subset of people will go on to a more enduring psychosis, and um, and and there's a range of risk factors that overlay at different points in development that might influence. Where, where you are on that spectrum and whether you transition from one of those points to another and that includes your genetics and your family history, whether your, your developing brain has been exposed to injury uh, early in life, you know, through, through um, you know, maternal illness, through, through head injury or through trauma um, and then uh, whether there's been signs in your early development of learning and sensory and motor problems indicating some compromises with your brain and then the other things that might you, you might get exposed to in later life in adolescence, stress of transitions in life, uh, trauma, and drug and alcohol use, cannabis and amphetamines in particular. So all of those things can come together in a varying mix in different people to, to contribute to, to their risk. I entirely agree with the points that others have made about the need to take a really person-focused approach. So the most important thing um, in, in starting to, to talk to Tim is not to understand the psychosis, but to understand and, and, and try and you know meet Tim and to understand who he who he so who he is, um, who the person he wants to be is, you know how that matches his family expectations, and what does he think and fear and understand is what's going on. What does all this mean to him? And, and I guess just to show that this recovery idea is not a completely newfangled idea um, that uh, you know, the, the Hippocrates said it's more important to know what sort of person has a disease than to know what sort of disease a person has. And, and certainly um, in, in terms of assessment, I do think it's the, the diagnostic label, what subset of psychosis someone has, actually isn't a critical thing for treatment at this point. It's important to understand the symptoms, it's important to understand the risk factors, but quite which, which of the diagnostic boxes of DSM you put someone in at this stage isn't necessarily that helpful. None of them really guide treatment that much and it's too early to, to really allocate any of those to Tim. So I think making a broad decision, does Tim have a psychosis or not, is really the only important diagnostic issue at this point. Here's some of the things that I, I would assess if I, if, if I was seeing Tim, some of the things that sort of jumped out of the story for me and clearly 
you know, you would do a comprehensive assessment. But I, I wondered about his family history. I'd really like to explore that story about the grandmother. Um, it does sound like that might have been, um, uh, you know, potentially a psychosis. Um, and that it'll be important for both understanding his genetic risk factors, but also his expectations and his family's expectations about illness and recovery. Um, you would like to get a good early development history. Um, young adults often don't know that. You often do have to get that corroboratively from their family or from their mother. Um, I'd be interested to explore the relationships and the academic decline. It does sound like he's been through a lot and lost a lot in his last couple of years, both with the relationship with Beth and with his expectations and his academic performance. And it would be important, although sometimes difficult, to try and tease out, has that been a trigger for this stress that he's under or has it been an effect of his um, state of mind changing or is it a bit of both, is it a bit of a vicious circle? Um, the substance use it would be critical and it's such a common part of these sort of presentations and you'd like to know how long, what he's been using in detail, how long for. There's some good evidence that earlier age of onset of cannabis is strongly associated with, with later development of psychosis, so how, how young he was. And amphetamines, particularly with this kind of slightly manic, slightly agitated and elevated sort of presentation, um, you wonder about amphetamines. Has he been using anything to help him stay up all night writing his, his um, play? Um, and, and that could be important. There's a mention of him holding his jaw oddly and sometimes in psychosis people can have um, mannerisms and changes in their motor behaviour but it would make me think is there something else going on affecting him neurologically? Unlikely but important to exclude. And of course you'd go through in detail his symptoms, um, his other perceptions, his beliefs and so on. Um, and risk, Shona mentioned talking about risk and, and I agree although I would say it's important to say we shouldn't do a risk assessment as such. What we should do is do a comprehensive assessment and within that think about risk and particularly think about if I was Tim, are there things that would make push me to acting uh, you know, violently or uh, recklessly or in a way that's going to damage me and my chances of recovery? The other thing I've got there is just to say a corroborative history is obviously critical wherever possible um, and you know it should be the default option that where we have family and supports and loved ones who know the person we should aim to speak to them as well and get some history. Um, so from the, and just to finish with two slides talking about medication and again I agree with the, princi the, the principles and, and points that others have made that I don't think medication would be a first line option here. I, I, I don't think reading the story of Tim as he is at the end of that vignette that you would immediately reach for the prescription pad. I do think your first urgent priorities are to, to assess and engage and monitor. But there may be a need for medication if this continues to evolve and some of the indications for medication would be if he's becoming more and more distressed and anxious, if his condition continues to worsen despite your efforts to engage him and support him, um, you know, and if there's worsening sleep disturbance or the perceptual abnormalities and the suspiciousness are getting stronger and more distressing, or if risk or consequences are, are there. I mean, the other important part of medication might be choice. And you know, some people, you, you can discuss the pros and cons of early medication uh, with them, and some people might choose, look, I, I would rather try that because I'm so distressed by what's happening. If you were choosing to go with medication, um, the three likely candidates here would be uh, are listed there, a benzodiazepine, an antipsychotic or a mood stabiliser. And in someone like this with very you know, brief and rapidly evolving symptoms and a degree of sleep disturbance, you might well want to just try a small amount of a, benz you know, a sleeping tablet at night, for example, a, you know, a temazepam or, or diazepam, and to see if even just breaking the, the, you know, getting someone a few good nights sleep can sometimes really calm things down a lot. If that wasn't successful, you might want to use an antipsychotic. Um, I think one of the big shifts has been a recognition of the real burden that antipsychotics do cause, and I think Toby mentioned that. And so I think you know you, the old idea of well, it can't do any harm to try an antipsychotic. I think is is clearly wrong. It can do harm to try an antipsychotic. So you want to you know it needs to be clear that the benefits are going to outweigh the potential harms. And look, uh, there is a a flavour of elevated mood in in this presentation, and it, sometimes you might consider a mood stabiliser like sodium valproate as a first line in, in this sort of situation, probably less often. And just finally then, to say if you were wanting to choose an antipsychotic, what would you choose? And, and it isn't an easy choice. Here's my kind of oversimplified and unevidence based view, but um, I've included in the references an excellent meta-analysis in The Lancet from a couple of years ago that summarises uh, a large number of these medications and their relative properties. Um, overall, all of these medications are equally effective and the difference between them is about the side effect profile. Um, and 
it is a difficult choice. On the one hand, we've got medications whose primary side effects are to make you sedated and gain weight. Um, and for some people, when they're highly agitated, that sedation can be beneficial. So olanzapine and, and quetiapine. Um, and often when people are admitted to hospital, they're started on those. But the weight gain is a substantial problem and, and, and an increasingly recognised one. At the other end, you've got side effect, medications that are, are much less sedating um, and can have other side effects, though, um, in terms of movement side effects or prolactin or akathisia. They're less common and not everyone gets them, but, but a substantial minority do. Um, and usually in, in a community setting for a young person with a first episode psychosis, mostly um, uh, I would be choosing something more in the middle there or you know, towards the right hand end of that arrow, particularly Abilify or, or, or Solian, that's either Aripiprazole or Amisulpride, which are, most young people seem to find more tolerable, aren't highly sedating and it, you're able to get on with work and study, um, but some people won't tolerate them. Um, risperidone is sometimes used, uh, my experience has been it's very poorly tolerated, especially in young women where it causes a lot of prolactin related problems. And in a community setting, I'd very rarely use olanzapine as a first line just because of those concerns about other things. So happy to talk more in the, in the question section, um, but that'd be my thoughts about some of the possibilities that might lie ahead with, with Toby. Thanks very much, Grant. Actually, before you go, there's been a um, lot of questions in the uh, general chat about um, the definition of psychosis. So we're, we're clearly not wanting to um, jump into any DS DSM-5 diagnosis right now because we don't know what the future is going to be. But um, it's probably a bit unfair to just drop you in it. But um, how how would you define psychosis? Well, look, I, I think. As I say, I think psychosis, if you distinguish just a symptom of psychosis, to define a syndrome of psychosis, uh, I would say it is the presence of um, two or more of hallucinations, uh, you know, in other words, abnormal perceptions in any modality, uh, uh, delusions, abnormal beliefs, suspiciousness and so on, um, and thought disorder uh, in the presence of other associated symptoms like agitation, motor disturbance, cognitive difficulty, and that, that those things are present and distinct and of, of a duration of more than a few days. Um, and I mean, if they're very severe and intense, they could, you can almost just, you could describe that in a very brief way, someone with a, a brief and very acute drug-induced psychosis, for example, all those features might occur together but only last a day or two. So you'd still call that a psychosis. Um, but it's, it's the combination of all of those symptoms in, in a way that's more than just for a few fleeting moments or hours. Thank you, that's really helpful. Now the other thing that's been coming up a lot and I think even the panel we're wanting to discuss with each other too is that many, many people um, are emphasising the importance of involving the family, not just, in, um, not just to find out more information but out of recognition that Tim lives with his family, we might see him for an hour a week but they're with him the rest of the time. So how do we support them? How do we help them to help him? How do we deal with issues of consent? So his parents clearly want to know what's going on but he's 19 and he might say he doesn't want them involved. So I thought perhaps we might ask you first, Morton, um, because you're a GP, there are many situations, particularly in rural areas, where not only would you know the, the family, but they'd all be your patients. And in some professions, that, that wouldn't be possible. But in general practice, it happens every day. So what, how would you think about you know, negotiating this issue of conversation with the family and with Tim? Uh, look, thanks. It, it's a really important conversation that we have to have with uh, patients and families quite frequently. Um, it's uh, certainly very much an issue in the rural areas where, uh, yeah, you treat the family and the grandparents and other, uncles and aunts and everybody and everybody knows everybody else's business, uh, particularly in small towns. Um, and But it also occurs in uh, metropolitan areas as well. I, I guess the, the first thing is really being very clear as to where the rules are, you know, um, making sure that people are aware of the uh, legal aspects uh, what is right, what is uh, appropriate um, and where you're not going to uh, allow it to go. Um, so the, 
the the main issue of, for everybody is uh, being very very um, uh, clear that uh, these are the rules um, that you'll be able to uh, ask questions and so forth, but at the point of some things you need you as a GP will need to talk with the individual and it's it works both ways. It's also the family, uh, not necessarily uh, things being told to uh, Tim uh, from the family either. Um, so it sometimes does put us in a very difficult situation. Um, often we do have some information that can be critical uh, to the situation that we do need to talk with Tim uh, about. And sometimes you get around it by making, um, uh, you know, trying to lead the conversation to those sort of things uh, without giving away where that information came from. You know, talk in generalities. You know, often people with these sort of things might have, um, and see what the responses are. Um, it is difficult sometimes in terms of. Uh, allowing people to uh, feel safe in the relationship, which is really important, um, and also to, particularly in rural situations, saying, "Look, you know, there's always going to be a bit of a rumor mill. Um, it's not coming from here. If you have any concerns, talk to me about it, um, because obviously, particularly with people." such as Tim, there may be or may develop an area of um, paranoia um, and that can complicate matters as well. Thanks, Morlan. Um, I, I mean, it, a lot of people in the um, discussion have been talking about the small community issues as well. Now, um, Toby, how, how would you go about handling this thing where maybe Tim doesn't want well, we know. Can we assume Tim doesn't want us to talk to his family, or have we asked him? But I suppose you know. How, how do you go about that as as um, a mental health nurse in your practice? Yeah, Mary. Good question. It's a real tension, isn't it? I think uh, Morton was sort of making that point between you know Tim's 19 years old, and we're wanting to encourage you know his growth as a young man, um, you know his autonomy, his right to self determination. And, and so forth. Uh, on the other hand, you know, as a mental health nurse in a community-based practice, I might see Tim uh, once a week uh, for about 45 minutes, and so my window into his life is so much smaller than the window of his family, generally speaking. Or if we sort of move it out a little bit further from his blood relatives and Imagine that um, Tim perhaps has some other associates or friends in his theatre group or the community of people involved in, in, in that sort of area of his life, then there may be real potential there for those people, whether it's his mother, whether it's his father, whether it's those other friends, to have a really positive impact on him. And so uh, I'm always at pains to take an approach from the very beginning in a community centre with uh, people generally to, to make the point that um, you know everything that we talk about is confidential except for two things. One is you know if they're going to hurt themselves or if they're going to hurt other people. Um, I make the point that we want to talk about those things and that you know I'm not going to be calling the police or anything, but that uh, you know I will be discussing those things most likely in a collaborative way with the team that I that I work with. Um, and then as the journey progresses with people uh, and they, let's imagine that Tim or someone like Tim requests that um, information is not shared with people who are close to them, uh, I will generally, I'll, obviously I'll respect that given he's a 19 year old male and so forth and you're wanting to work with him uh, to build a sense of choice and assist him to see the results of those choices. Uh, on the other hand, as things progress, if if uh, I may make suggestions down the track that it would be good to involve uh, family and and fr or friends 
uh, you know, depending on, on what the challenges are. And so I, I think the whole case study is really relevant uh, and there's been some great questions in the general chat around the idea of, um, you know, what is this? Is it is it that we're working with a person with um, with sort of an early developing psychosis? Do we start to use terms like schizophreniform disorder, schizophrenia? And I think uh, Grant made some good points about erring away from those things. But if we frame it as a young man who's trying to pursue a, um, a satisfying life, then we, we can't go far, far wrong because we'll be able to bring uh, conversations in the context of a relationship with him around to what are in his best interests from his perspective. And so uh, that's the way things normally, things normally roll in my neck of the woods. I mean, I'm in an urban centre, though, I've got to say, and normally working in a community-based context. And so I, I realise that things can vary tremendously for mental health nurses and others in inpatient settings and in other, other settings. Thanks, Toby. I'd like to bring Shona back in. Shona, one of the issues, um, you know, uh, Toby's just been talking about helping um, him to lead a satisfying life, but one of the... You noticed a p potential concern in Tim's story about his kind of obsession with his ex-girlfriend. Mm. I just wondered if you wanted to comment on that. Um, well, I think it, it, it comes to, um, I guess, what a lot, of, a lot of the panel have said, that I think it's important to do a really careful assessment with Tim. So I don't think we've got any, any signs at the moment that there's anything to worry about where Beth's concerned, but um, it could develop that way. So, so sometimes people become obsessed with um, with people in their lives and um, uh, may start to act in, in dangerous or frightening ways where Beth's concerned. So I'm not saying that that's happening now, but what I'm saying is that we do need to be very careful in our um, assessment and um, to really understand what's going on for Tim and what's what's behind um, the ways the ways he, in which he's behaving. Um, so. In terms of, um, I, I take it that um, risk assessment wasn't seen as, as the best term to use, but I think it is really important to have um, a thorough assessment and, and to be aware of where there might be risks um, for Tim and for other people in his life. Sure, thanks for that, Shani. Yeah, I think he had noticed that he had been watching um, Beth's flat in the evening and um, yeah, following her around at uni and in the community, which was which was worth noting. Um, now I'd like to bring um, Grant back in. So there's there's quite a lot of questions also um, about what what kind of prognoses might um, Tim have, and I, I suppose right now when we've just met him, we can't really answer that. But I just I want, what what would be good prognostic signs? Um, yeah, well, look, I think overall, as people have said, the, the, the view of prognosis is in much more positive than it than it used to be, um, and Part of that complexity of people being on a spectrum um, is the view of prognosis and the research and the data on prognosis very much depends on where you're looking in that spectrum, whether you're looking at people in high risk states or after they've had a first episode of psychosis or after they've had a first admission to hospital. And, and I agree, it, you know, one of the essential goals here is to avoid hospital. So in, broadly, the, the good prognostic signs would might be, um, well, certainly, uh, an older age of onset, so you know, if someone has a very young age of onset of psychosis in early adolescence, in the 14, 15, 16, that's concerning. Um, uh, the absence of uh, so when you look at, at, at Tim's story, um, you know, there's he's had been apparently um, functioned well, had a good personality, good strengths, uh, good, good um, academic and social functioning. So they're all good prognostic signs, um, uh, and. In a funny way, the presence of drugs, paradoxically, uh, can be a good prognostic sign. Um, if there's a clear external trigger, you know, such as cannabis or amphetamines, provided that can be brought under control, um, then in fact, 
you know, th there's quite a bit of research that shows that people with drug-induced psychosis uh, and drug-related psychosis can actually have so amongst the best outcomes, uh, but but only if the psychosis is, is uh, sorry, only if the substance use is well controlled. Um, so so there's a number of things here that would make you feel quite hopeful. You know, Tim's a, a healthy young man with good supports where there's a drugs playing a part at a time of stress and loss, and and you would hope that you know if you can help get all those things under control, he could be back on his feet again quickly. And Grant, is it, is it right that that the understanding in early psychosis now is that because there are many many things that might be contributing. So there might be stress, there might be developmental trauma, there might be substance use, relationship breakup, all kinds of things. Yes. And but the the issue is that that we we provide a collaborative, holistic approach to the psychosis without at this moment worrying too much about where it came from. Is that right? Look, that's true, um, and but, but and in every person, there's going to be a different combination of some known risk factors in their past and in their current situation, and trying to understand those through assessments is important, and trying to help the person themselves understand that can be really important. So one issue, one real dilemma that can come up is um, the dilemma about uh, cannabis, and I know there's been some questions in the chat there uh, as well about, well, yeah, but what if Tim decides he wants to keep smoking uh, or keep using drugs? And then that often is a real dilemma, um, and a sort of you know a moralistic and lecturing approach usually doesn't work that well. Um, but a framework that says, well, it's important for you to understand your risk factors, um, and if you're someone who's got a strong family history, you might have a genetic you know loading towards um, this sort of problem, then. Exposing yourself to other risk factors like um, cannabis is not necessarily a great choice for you. It might mean that your friends can get away with it, but you can't. So I often use the example of, you know, as a former redhead, um, you know, I've got a risk, you know, vulnerability to with a, with a family history of melanoma. I've got a, fam a vulnerability towards skin cancer. So I have to be careful about the things I expose myself to. Um, and you know, people are kind of used to that idea. There's a lot more familiarity with that sense of people having personal risk factors in, in genetics and breast cancer and so on that, that people are aware of. So I think that's important. Um, and I, was, I, I mean, I'll, yeah, there's some research that's been done looking at rates of progression and so on, which I could mention if it was relevant. Okay, thanks. That's really helpful. Um, Shona, I just wondered, some people have been asking if, if the young person will not go and see any of the experts and you're like, you know, a private practitioner, psychologist or a GP in the community and they won't go, what, are there any particular um, assessment tools that practitioners can use to get more of a sense of this themselves? Um, yeah, well, there are a lot of um, different assessment tools that are available, um, and I guess in in Tim's case, um, we might be thinking of um, something like the CALMS, the Comprehensive Assessment of At Risk Mental State. So that's a a, um, a questionnaire or interview based assessment that um, helps people decide whether someone is at at high risk of developing psychosis or has actually crossed the line into what would be considered a, a psychotic episode, um, at which point um, more assertive treatment might be indicated. Um, so that's a tool that was developed here in Australia, but there are other versions or uh, instruments like that um, in other parts of the world. They're called, um, oh, I've just forgotten the name. Of, uh, there are some American versions. Um, of those sorts of instruments as well. Um, a lot of those sorts of um, tools are available from the, the Origin um, website. If people wanted to look, they could find um, information about those things there. Is, is the CALMS tool there, Shona? Yeah, yeah, there's a manual available about the CALMS, so that is there, yes. Oh, that's excellent. Thank you for that. Now, Morton, I know that you had a comment there about um, from a general practitioner perspective, because it's often you guys that are sort of left in this situation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, not uncommonly, you actually have to support the uh, the family uh, to improve their skills at how in, how to deal with uh, the situation if the young person or older person, for that matter, uh, won't come and seek help. Particularly if they're actually functioning okay, uh, in that you can't absolutely intervene. Um, so, you know, letting them know what is uh, what they can do to perhaps de-escalate some of his um, uh, thoughts, uh, good listening practices sometimes 
is really helpful to remind family that they actually should listen uh, to what the person is saying um, and certainly not uh, get the person angry or offside. Um, balance because often we tread the line between keeping the person engaged in order to uh, maintain a therapeutic relationship uh, at a later date and actually intervening too fast and both can be difficult. Thank you. And look, I know one of the other areas of support that we haven't um, covered at all tonight, I think I might ask you about this Toby because I expect you have experience, is that there are also many um, consumer and carer support groups. So there are families who've um, you know, ex experienced caring for someone with mental ill health who support each other and also um, groups of people who've experienced mental ill health themselves um, and they can be a great support. So I just wonder if you wanted to comment on that. Yeah, sure. Well, uh uh, recently conducted PhD research actually looking at a thing called the clubhouse psychosocial model of, of rehabilitation and um, it's a fantastic uh, model that works mostly uh, with adults uh, with lived experience of mental illness and um, assisting them with a very sort of employment vocational work focus uh, getting them working alongside each other in non-paid work and then trying to uh, assist them towards transitioning to uh, paid jobs in the community and um, and other socially satisfying activities. I mean there's there's other uh, groups such as GROW which someone's mentioned tonight in the general chat. Um, there's a new uh, approach uh, in the consumer movement called recovery colleges. I'm, I'm aware of one that's been set up in South Australia and also over here in um, southeastern um, area in, in in Sydney, uh, I think I think one thing to say about those um, approaches is that uh, we don't have um, many of those approaches that are focused on young people. And um, it would be fantastic in the future to see places like the clubhouse model of psychosocial rehab or or recovery colleges actually developed for that young adult age group from maybe from sort of 16 to 25 year old age group. The head space approach has been rolled out and that's uh, certainly, you know, in, in a lot of locations it's a fairly, um, you know, professional uh, focus sort of approach. Uh, it would be great to see uh, consumer-led groups uh, get the sort of support that's due I, I think if you look at Richard Warner's meta-analysis of recovery from schizophrenia where he looked at sort of 100 years worth of research um, going back to the early 1900s and looked at uh, what actually assists people towards recovery, the main thing that he found was that um, it's employment and it's employment for people with schizophrenia uh, more than pills, more than um, access to professional services and I think that one of our approaches in Australia has been to rely very heavily on um, experts, clinicians, uh, for want of a better way of describing it, a bio sort of medical approach to mental health. Um, some of these other approaches, uh, perhaps from overseas, perhaps yet to be discovered here in Australia, may be fantastic things for the future. Yes, thanks. Thanks a lot for that, Toby. And I, it sounds as though you know there there is a lot of research in this area internationally. And some of the questions before I mentioned the open dialogue approach from Finland, which yeah. is essentially based in family therapy. We we don't have time to to go into it, but people are saying you know there is good evidence for that. When is it going to happen in Australia? Um, so we don't probably have time to discuss that right now. But um, thanks for um, talking to us about those as well. Now I'd like to, um, we're just actually, as usual, running out of time to have such a fantastic conversation. So I'd like to start bringing in the panellists to just give us their um, their sort of parting message that they'd like people to go away with. So I think that I might start with you, Grant, if that's okay. Um, yeah, look, I think the, the, the overall parting message is um, that you, you need a difficult balance here. You know that, that it's really critical that there's 
an attempt to engage and assess. And there's, a, I think, that window of opportunity uh, idea that that you you've got to work with um, with Tim, uh, but uh, and there's an urgency, and you need to both respect his um, his choice and his his rights to, to, to choice, but also he's he's got a right to treatment, and, and and you need to do that as quickly as you can. So, so I think that's where there's a real urgency to work, um, and that while the view is more positive than it used to be, and, and for, for good reasons, there's still you know, a substantial minority. So you know, up to a third of young people at risk, uh, in an at-risk mental state, will transition to psychosis within, um, within uh, two to three years. Uh, and um, and you know, so it's really important to try and do what you can as early as you can. Thanks, Thanks very much, Brad. Um, I think, Shona, we might go to you now. Is there anything that you'd like us to think about as we finish up? Yeah, thanks, Mary. I mean, I guess perhaps to just inject a little bit of, of hope, there are um, some places around Australia that are developing um, um, open dialogue approaches being um, trialled in the South East Melbourne um, area in the Headspace Early Psychosis Program. And there are recovery colleges also there and um, in other parts of Australia that are specifically for young people. So I think we are seeing a, um, a an improvement and a growing focus on functional recovery, including um, peer-led peer support programs, um, and an increased focus on physical health. And um, I guess generally the area of functional recovery is, um, is, is being given appropriately more and more prominence in helping young people recover from psychosis. So I think there's plenty more work to do and there's loads more um, services to develop, but there is, um, is light on, on, on the horizon. Area. Thanks, Shona. And um, now, Morton, since we just mentioned physical health, it's great to have your contribution as a GP. Is there anything that you'd like to leave us with tonight? Yeah, look, I think that the thing that I would leave people with, although it's really hard, is making sure that we all talk together as a team. Um, otherwise, uh, some of the opportunities that we have uh, get lost. Um, and although sometimes it's really hard to make those opportunities to uh, spend some time talking about it, it actually does work really well for the patient um, because these cases usually start very much as a grey area um, and you need to be across it so that you can pick up on things as quickly as you can. Thanks a lot, Morton. And Toby, I'd like to bring you in to finish. You had the, my favourite slide of the night, which was that lovely one of recovery with the arrow and then the completely circuitous scribble, which has been my experience. <laughs> um, is sure. there anything that, anything that you'd like to, um, to finish with tonight? No, oh, I'd just like to thank everyone for their enthusiasm. I'm just looking at the screen here. I think I can see nearly 800 people online at the moment. So it's just, just a fantastic... Uh, reflection of the amount of care that there is in our community for people with a lived experience of mental illness and um, I just think it shows the sort of the great you know possibilities of the internet doesn't it for us to collaborate in this kind of a way. Mind you I, I was listening recently uh, to someone talking about uh, the need for us to have more uh, what they called uh, narrowband conversations and they talked about you know, just switching off the internet, switching off the phone, and actually just just talking uh, one to one with, with individual people. And so, um, I think uh, just encourage everyone to do as much of that as possible. When we talk about collaboration, let's not make it all over the web, but let's do it in person. Um, and um, and there's great great things to come in in mental health. Thanks, Toby. It's a really positive note to end on. And um, you know, I, I think that that's been one of the key messages for tonight is that developing that relationship with Tim and ideally with his family. In fact, I think assuming that the family are involved unless there's a really good reason not to be. Um, and also working together as a team is, is going to bring the best outcomes and there's an increasing body of evidence for that. So it's just been really um, uh, positive and hopeful to have such a collaborative view and to know that this is the best way forward. Also recognising that many people are in remote places and just have to do the best they can. Um, so sometimes feeling part of the greater network through the MHPN can help with that too. And one thing that perhaps didn't come up is that we need to remember to care for ourselves 
particularly when we're dealing with really stressful situations like this. So I hope people have peers um, who, can, who they can debrief, debrief with or supervisors if that's their uh, profession practice. So thanks everyone for your participation tonight. Please make sure that you complete the exit survey before you log out. Um, it'll pop up on your screen after the session closes, so just stay online till you see it. You will be um, emailed a certificate of attendance for this webinar if you registered, and you'll also be sent a link to the online resources associated with the webinar within a week. So the next webinar will be in February 2017. Have a rest-filled break and we look forward to seeing you refreshed in 2017 for another series of MHPM webinars. And make sure you sign up and then you'll receive the notification. So I hope that you all have a very happy new year. And if you're interested in joining an MHPN network in your local area, you can see a list of those on the website. Um, and also there's more information about the other online activities and the webinar library and so on. So once again, thanks everyone for your contribution to the panel and also to the 800 participants who logged in tonight and the really lively engagement in the chat box was very welcome. So um, good evening everyone and see you in 2017.